Welcome to the Poisoner's Cabinet. I'm Sinead. And I'm Nick. And this is your weekly podcast exploring the lives of the great poisoners and macabre murders from across the centuries and creating curious cocktails inspired by the desert Pidel. And it's episode 137. It is. It is. It is. It God, is. these 30s drag. Oh, yes. It's been 30s for months now. <laughs> months and months and months of 30s. This is about more than the podcast, isn't it? <laughs> Something about your 30s. You're oh, like, no. why did they leave why me? Why they've left me? <laughs> oh. We've obviously not hit our end of our 20s yet, you know. Yeah, well, yeah. Yes, absolutely. For all the young people listening to this, who would immediately switch off if they knew really how, how cripplingly old, old we, we are. are. <laughs> I'm young and cool. Children, let's tell you about the landline. <laughs> do you remember MySpace? I do. I do. Yes, unfortunately. <laughs> 137 <laughs> episodes. And happy December, Nick. Mer- yes. We are into the season of goodwill, apparently. We will be shortly. Not just yet. Are you, is it too early for you? Yeah. No, none of, none of that goodwill bollocks. You don't sort of get to the 1st of December and then sort of like spring uh, open the mixed pies. Oh, God, no. Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe a week beforehand. Oh, dear. Might get vaguely jolly, but that's Ooh. only with a lot of drink. Mold so wine. Before that, nah. You see, I don't mind putting up my decorations a bit earlier, only because I have a tradition that I basically drink a bottle of Baileys while I do it. <laughs> And there's some good options out there. Just a Saturday. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, it's, I'm swapping you tequila might have, you for might have Baileys. Chocolate orange flavored Baileys. Exactly. It's Christmassy. Yeah. I'm going to have a lovely hazelnut liqueur. Oh, how delightful! Because Sounds it's the season. Much more civilized. <laughs> how are you, Nick? Otherwise. Mm. 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 Good. Yeah, all very discombobulated. Holidays <laughs> and then going back to work and then not knowing who I am or what's going on. It, it, it was four days, Nick. <laughs> yeah, I know, but four days away from work and then I don't mm. know what's going on anymore. And we had a very lovely holiday lovely in holiday. Suffolk. Nick, me and Emma from Real Life Ghost Stories, we all went away to a lovely cottage. Had a very big bath. Very big bath. Which was very exciting. And a very big fire. Yeah, very big fire that was supposed to be lit. We didn't just burn the place down. It was a lovely adventure. And yes, there's going to be a bonus episode on Patreon for you delicious listeners of our adventures where we went out into the wild with our portable microphones and recorded our ghost hunting and alien hunting and myth hunting adventures. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. And we found lots. Did we? Y- yeah. Okay. Sure. Yeah. I got a feeling at you one a, you, point. You got a, you got a tingly feeling. I did. <laughs> Not sure that was the ghost. (laughs) (laughs) Whatever it was, it changed my life. It changed my life. (laughs) Any poisonings this week? Uh, oh yes, yeah, so many. Many we regaled so at the club. So many, so many. Well, us on Friday, we drank a lot. We drank an awful lot. We did. Then went to a gin distillery tour, it? which was great. Gin and tonic at eleven thirty in the morning. Cure for all things, I feel. Apart from that, probably not. Mm. Probably not. Do you remember what my job was? Poisoned your brain. Poisoned my brain. No idea what's going on there. Well, as we head into December, lots of poisoning things will be around us. If our previous Christmas episodes have taught you nothing, everything at Christmas is poisony. So be very, very careful. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Death by Christmas. Christmas wants to kill you. And tis the season as well. Thank you to everyone who has been sharing the quintessential thing of December, your Spotify rap. Oh, yes, I saw lots of that. Yes, hey. loads of people sharing how much you have been listening to The Poisonous Cabinet on Spotify. Obviously, there's loads of people who listen to this on <laughs> iTunes and other platforms. But thank you, thank you, thank you from the bottom of our hearts to everyone who's been sharing it. And it's really nice. Nice to Lovely see to people see. going, oh, you've listened to 5,000 hours of... <laughs> hours? No, minutes. <laughs> 5,000 hours. 525,000. That's a lot of us talking bollocks. I know, I was wondering. It was like, oh, how, how many times did you listen? <laughs> yeah, and do well that. done. Don't do that. Drive you mad. Well, speaking of being driven mad by the Poisoner's Cabinet and drinking a bottle of Baileys until you don't feel feelings, I think it is time for us to thank our delicious Patreon subscribers. Oh, no, most certainly. Thank you very much to Alec. To Caprice. To... Sharon to Leah Maskey to Carla Valentine Woo! thank you very much darling and to Penelope Ryholt hooray raw, raw, very raw. sexy all people all of you marvellous people a special shout out there of course to the delicious the delicious Carla Valentine a very big friend of the show and very famous in her own right as well as a as an actual bona fide mortician <laughs> an actual bona fide person well done as an actual bona fide person she has many proper titles but we just like to kind of go ah Morticia Adams in the flesh <laughs> we love you Carla well Nick are you ready oh god no <laughs> <laughs> Do you need a lie down? I do. Don't worry, I've got a surprise for you in a minute. Oh, okay. I like su- do, I, do I like surprises? I don't know. <laughs> when it's me, you go, oh, God, no. But are you ready to drink cocktails and talk about poison? I think I probably should be. Or we could drink poison and talk about cocktails. It's drinking cocktails and having a nap. Is that the third option? 
<laughs> I mean, what happens when I'm telling the story <laughs> happens? I can't stop you. <laughs> We've got to put an episode out. If there's gentle snoring. Maybe we should turn this one into a little lullaby kind of <laughs> bedtime I'm stories I'm sure it would be far too riveting for such a thing. Yes, it so, is riveting. Excellent. And then I look forward to it with a cocktail in hand. <laughs> and the doctor decreed that everything was cholera <laughs> and everyone lived happily ever after yeah. dead <laughs> in their coffins. <laughs> Good night, children. So relaxed already. Okay. Should we go with the first one? Yeah, go on then. Okay, good. Hooray, hooray, hooray. It is my story this week, and we can't, we can't, we can't possibly have a story without a cocktail in hand. As you know, dear listeners, every week we choose a secret ingredient that is inspired by the tale that we tell, and it will flavor our cocktail of the week. And mm. this week's secret ingredient is mm. jam. Jam. Jam, jam, jam. Jam, jam, jam. Jam, 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 jam. jam, 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 jam. jam lovely, jam, jam. lovely preserves, lovely jam, delicious <laughs> jam from the jar. Now, okay. I think jam is a good ingredient. I Yes, yeah. Oh, oh, have I been naive? Well, there are, I mean, there are a few out there. Yeah, oh, but not as many as we'd think. Not as many as you would think. You don't just chuck some jam in there. Well. Do, do we get something with scones? We, well, we, we, well, I see, you know what, you text me, you text me jam, and I say, have we done jam? No, so we've done scones before. We have done scones before. And then that was quite a jam-heavy cocktail Ooh, with yeah. the scones. Oh, so now this time that there's jam, is it's it going to be a scone-heavy? Scone scone-heavy <laughs> cocktail. <laughs> so we're having a baked cocktail now. Ooh, oh, uh, I, that, that sounds amazing. Okay, I'm <laughs> no, all right no, with that. No, I lied. Well, no. with jam then as the ingredient, mm. what have you come up with? Well, we're having a bit of a Nick's special. <gasps> and I haven't quite come up with a name yet. Okay. So we'll have to see how it goes, as if it gets a good name or a terrible name. We'll have to find out. I've come up with something... Possibly good, possibly dreadful. By the time you come out of the poisonous cabinet kitchen, you will have a name. Maybe. You know the only thing that would make this better? Yeah. <laughs> Something's happening. Actual scones. Actual scones. With <laughs> actual clotted cream. <laughs> I've done it finally this week. We, every time we have something food related, we go, oh, snacks. We need some snacks. I have not had dinner yet. I have brought scones. I have brought clotted cream. Nick's got the jam. We're going to have a cocktail and an afternoon tea. It sounds delightful. Hooray. Okay, I think it is time for us to scurry into the poisonous cabinet kitchen and shake up a storm. So we'll see you in a minute. We'll see you in a bit. And we're back. Hello. Well, Nick, mm. for the first time in a very, very, very long time, we have a drink and snacks. And snacks. <laughs> <laughs> now, we have created an honour of the jam being the secret ingredient. We have some traditional scones, scones, mm. scones, if you will, on the side with cream and jam. Delicious. I did cream first and then jam afterwards, I, I, just because it was easier. Don't just because yes, that's what they, the order they came out in. But we have a beautiful, beautiful, almost ruby, purpley, yeah. jammy coloured drink jammy in front of drink. us. And what is it called, Nick? I don't. I'm still unsure. I'm still unsure. I'm waiting to see if it's any good. Okay. And before then you name it. before I name it. Ooh, interesting. That's a bit like childbirth, isn't it? <laughs> Do I like the look of this child? Yeah. No, it... I shall leave it nameless. <laughs> just want to see if this kid works out before I assign any love to it. <laughs> Pretty much. Well, some people do that. They have a few names in their head and they just kind of go, oh, it's definitely a... It's definitely a Bob. It's definitely a Hortense. <laughs> we shall sip and sample the drink before we name it. Yeah. All right. Cheers. Cheers. Merry Christmas. Ooh. Oh, I like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nice mouthfeel. Bold. Mm -hmm. Citrusy. It's mm -hmm. sweetness to it. Mm -hmm. It has alcohol in it. It does have alcohol in it. The jam is a lot sweeter than I thought it was going to be. It's very sweet at the start. I thought it was going to be a bit of a tartar, a tartar jam. <laughs> and I thought that might work nicely with this, and it is too sweet. You feel shall, it's too sweet. I feel it's too sweet. Mm -hmm. She'll have to find alternative jam. It's a nice sweetness to start with. It doesn't give way to a really powerful hit of alcohol no. later, so it Just probably needs something to balance it out. Overpoweringly sugary. And that will go well with our scones. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Okay, so why don't you talk us through it while I bite into a scone? <laughs> okay. I mean, there are quite a lot of recipes out there, writings on adding jams to, to drinks, making it almost like a sour, really, sort of. Mm. Um, and adding the fruit, which has some of the sugar and some of the, the tartness of citrus, replacing it with some sort of jam, which generally has both of those, mm. kind of have both those qualities. So I thought, I'll give that a go. Yeah. So I've made a sort of jammy margarita. Ooh, lordy, lordy, <laughs> lordy. I'm, I'm so happy. I don't know why. Yeah. Why is this changing my mind? I don't know. So it's a jammy margarita. So okay. we have tequila. Wait. And then we have a bit of Cointreau. We have some bramble jam. 
Bramble jam. Bramble jam. Ooh. So I thought, well, like a strawberry jam is really, really sweet. It's really it is. sugary, really sweet. Yeah, they put a lot of sugar in that. So I Raspberry I, jam, nice. Well, nice, but, but again, sugary Again, sweet. quite sugary. So I thought, oh, I wanted something with a bit more bite to it. This doesn't have enough. Blackberry. Black, yeah, so I needed, yeah, something really, perhaps a cherry one might have been interesting. A black cherry. Well, that's the thing with jam, though, because they use the pectin for the jam for because the so, sugar content has to be particularly yes. high for it to achieve the coating on so, a spoon. I mean, so I put, like, no, there's no additional sugar. There's no, like, agave no. or anything like that in this. And there is a bit of lime juice. So I thought bramble and lime, Ooh, that, that yeah. could work. But not perhaps, I think, not enough lime juice. And it's just, it's too, too sugary. But there is a bit of fruit. You are getting a bit of fruit coming through there. Definitely. So there is definitely a brambly, brambliness there. I think the sugariness is too overpowering. I'd say it's a bramble margarita. Something bramble, like that. Yeah, absolutely. A bramble margarita. Oh, yeah. We've um, made that. that, I mean, that way, it's not It's not amazing. Yeah, it's all right. For people who like their drinks a little sweeter, yeah. this is lovely. It, it is, it's not bad at all. There's some sickly sweet drinks where I'd go, what the hell have you done to us? But um, it's... Yeah, it's got the the jamminess. That's the thing is that jam is so sweet and it can be quite thick and clawing. You've not overdone it on here. It just probably just needed more lime. Yeah, yeah, more, yeah, absolutely. I don't think you've used too much jam. I think you haven't used enough not of everything not, else. Not enough everything else. <laughs> so in a way, it balances out. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, oh, good for an experiment. I think so. Yeah. So you're gonna call it. I think, oh yeah, Bramble Margarita. Bramble Margarita. Okay, with that, absolutely. It's brambly jam, and it is based on a margarita. So. Indeed. Can't argue with that. Very nice. Would you like to dive into a scone? I would like to dive into a scone now. Uh So I'm going to shut up for a bit while I eat a scone. (laughs) Okay, people, don't eat scones while doing a podcast because it just tends to cement in your mouth. Quality podcasting going on Mm. here. That's a good scone though, isn't it? Crumbly. Crumbly. Mm. It's Mm. crumbly and lots of clotted cream and jam on there as well. And I've got butter on the side if you want it. I have a friend who... No, I have a friend who is an afternoon tea fiend she's actually australian and she will sit and critique your, your scones and your yam. i think i think that's a little bit messy i think you could ratio that out better but she insists you've got to put butter on there mm. then the cream then the jam and no, i'm with her on that i don't know I think it's a bit too much i'm oh. having another bite before we dive into things you're getting the better end of the deal exactly now. i don't have to say anything i can just sit here and eat scones that's fine there's loads more scones as well and Excellent. more cream you're just going to be eating them with your hands like smearing it on pretty much with our bramble margaritas in one hand and our scones beautifully laden with treats in the other. Are you ready for a story, Nick? Oh, yes. Good, good, good. Today, Nick, we have the tale of Louisa May Merrifield. Oh. Also known as the Blackpool Poisoner. Oh, uh, yes. Oh, uh, yes. Uh, Are you yes, familiar with this tale? Familiar with this tale. Is it on the list, is it? On the, there was some modicum of reading has been done about no. this one. So, yes, absolutely. Well, I pray I will do it justice. I sure you shall. So, dug around on this one, and this is uh, this is quite the roller coaster. Let's start with Louise's past. Now, an adequate amount is known about her childhood. Well, maybe. For it is resplendent with births and marriages and births and marriages and maybe another marriage and then some crime. And that's even before we get to the meat of the story, Nick. It sounds busy. There is a lot of marriage and birth going on. Oh. So Louisa was born in Wigan in uh, around 1906. Now, she's the youngest of seven children to a father who works in the coal mines. Oh. Uh, originally in the black country and then moved to Wigan for the fun because it's a wild place so yes coal miner and his wife his wife didn't get a profession in any of the records or name no 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 no. she was she was just Just wife i think her name was emma actually okay yeah i didn't write down the name of the father i was like no he doesn't get a name either (laughs) the record of louise's birth doesn't seem to exist anywhere now it doesn't mean that she's a ghost (laughs) doesn't mean she never existed she never existed all of this is made up all this is made up no um research done by local newspapers when they revisited this story years later couldn't find in the local archive they couldn't find the record of her birth they could find the record of her parents and some of the birds but maybe they were thinking okay maybe did the parents just forget as you did back in the day, or were they kind of okay? We've had seven children and we can't afford to give them. <laughs> not just anymore. not register this one anymore. No, 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 because there's a war coming. Two, actually. <laughs> Don't think they knew that. There's a, there's a war coming, so so we won't register so, the birth. So we won't do that, just in case. <laughs> the Titanic is due to sink, <laughs> so let's just not register she her. Was born to a family of psychics, <laughs> <laughs> because somehow that will help. So not much is known about her actual childhood. It was it happened. She had one. She had one. Well done, her. Uh, she doesn't really show up on the records until she decides to wed in 1931. Mm-hmm. She married Joseph Ellison, who was a year younger than her. And together, they would go on to have six children. Okay. Busy, busy, busy. So she's the youngest of 
seven. Now they've had six children together. Um, at the time, she worked as a Salvation Army captain. Oh, very good. So good, good Christian and, and, yeah. and aid giving and respectable, like. Now, unfortunately, two children do die in infancy. Nothing untoward. Mm. We know the children die. But she still had her four surviving sons and daughters. Very good. For a bit. For a bit. At least. They didn't die. <laughs> they just ran away. They didn't run away. But they had to be removed from Louisa. Oh, that's less good. Yes. Because she was found guilty in 1946 of ration book fraud. Ooh, <gasps> sneaky behaviour. Yes, for a Salvation Army captain. Oh, I know. Yes, Dreadful. it's not good behaviour. She refused. She was not only found guilty of the fraud, but she refused to pay the £10 fine. Now, it was something like 400 quid at the time. Yeah. So she was sentenced to 84 days in prison. Oh, well, nice. And that meant the children taken into care. Uh, the father was still around. But, but a, man, clearly, a man can't be expected to do look after the children. <laughs> They're like, Daddy, please. They're like, no, 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 clearly there's no hope for you. <laughs> Absolutely not. Goodbye. Uh, a little aside here. So you, you're a history buff. You, you I know. like some history. Do you know much about rationing the crimes around in, in the Second World War? Because it, it's a fascinating little bit of history. Well, yeah, I know. There was, yes, people used to sell their rations and mm. stock up on rations. And mm. then a lot of black market shenanigans going on and things. Yes, all illegal. Oh, indeed. Because as soon as the war hit, it was like, no, 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 we have to preserve everything. Mm. You're in the depths of war. You could be fined the equivalent of thousands of pounds in today's money for stockpiling food in your home. And I did read one case of a woman named Elsie Carter of Caversham. She was fined 36 pounds, 36 pounds for stashing 75 pounds of preserves. Okay. That's not the link. That's, 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 is that it? Is that what we've got? That I found in a side <laughs> and went, no, this is fine. She had some jam. She had some jam. She had 75 pounds of bloody jam, 196 tins of fish, 82 tons of milk. 82 tons of milk. <laughs> 82. <laughs> no, it's tins, you stupid bitch. <laughs> Her house was just bursting at the seams. With milk. She's got a tanker out back. <laughs> <laughs> there are some traumatised cows. No, 86 tins. Of, tins milk, of milk, 81 tins of meat, and 98 tins of mixed fruit, mm. all hidden under her stairs. Nice, that's a party. Yes, and of course the the officers, the rationing officers, I think they were called. You know, they could just do house calls and break into your house, and they found them. And she went, oh, "I totally forgot I had those." <laughs> well, how did they get there? <laughs> how on earth would they get there? Yes, so she was fined lots of money for mm. for stockpiling. No naughty business. Now, Louisa wasn't stockpiling, as far as we know. She may have been doing what quite a few people did at the time, was maybe using a dead relative's ration book to get more supplies. May have even been claiming her dead children were still alive in order to get Mm. more food. These are desperate times. Well, indeed. And there were riots. People are hungry. There were all sorts of protests about rationing. Not read hugely into the moral implications of it, but it's it's an interesting time. You know, you get your weekly bacon and sugar and your fat. The diet wasn't good at the time. It was just fat and bacon and sugar and maybe an egg. Yeah, but people were a bit more active then than they are now, I feel. Oh, okay. So, <laughs> so, and you do you do read things about watch okay. documentaries and, and that actually people were very quite healthy because it was a huge amount of vegetables because vegetables and things weren't rationed. No, because you could grow um, those. You could grow your own things there and things like bread wasn't rationed and stuff like that because you could grow it. Bake it. Um, mm. Yes, grow, or you grow wheat <laughs> and bake it. Do you not grow whole loaves? Yes, bake? loaves. They, they, they come on trees. Yeah, you yeah. just go and pluck them. I tell you, this generation probably thinks to do. <laughs> so, um, so I think, it, yeah. I think so. I think people were generally healthy because they were a lot more active and a lot more running around, not sitting in front of computers and such. Interesting. Well, mm. I'll bear this in mind for okay. the story. But when she was released from jail, kids were not given back to her, but she did mm. go back to Joseph. But Joseph would die aged 44 in 1949 of infective hepatitis. Ooh. Yes. No so one that. that happens. Nobody, no, nothing underworld suspected there. It's unfortunate. It's an unfortunate dies quite young. But Louise uh, decides she must marry again. She needs another husband. Quite. She marries in 1950, Richard Weston, who was 78 at the time okay. of their nuptials. That's a that's a, that's a bit of a gap. She's 46 at this time. Yeah. Just 10 weeks later, mm. Richard is dead from a heart yeah. attack. Mm. I'm feeling potential ulterior motives with that one. Again, nothing suspicious. The death was ruled as natural causes. Yeah. The only record that one source, again, from the area found was a line in the police records where she apparently said Louisa had set the bed so that when he got in it, it would collapse. It did so, and the shock killed him. Well, yeah, it would be quite a shock, I feel. There is no other reference to that. (laughs) 
to Louisa on her exploding beds. Yes. <laughs> is she like, just playing a prank on him or a cunning murderer? Or is, what, what, is she do- what is she doing? What is she doing with the bed? Mm. But then they're just like, oh, that happens. They're soaring legs. Just, just like... <laughs> Two thirds of the way through. <laughs> it's very wily e. coyote, really, isn't it? Well, so. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think they investigated for a while, going, "Did she kill him?" Like, no, it definitely he died of a heart attack. So, there you go. She may have been a criminal mastermind, but <laughs> second husband, husband number two, is dead. She better get another one. Mm. Better get another one. Absolutely. Louisa met her third husband, sixty-eight-year-old widower Alfred Edward Merrifield, a few weeks after her second husband's death. Now, Alfred, as I said, was a widower. His wife had died the previous year. But when he met Louisa, he decided it it was time to to (laughs) leave his grief behind. Time to move on. Quiet. I mean, he already actually abandoned his wife and 10 (laughs) children. Oh, God. 20 years previously. But Mm. the poor widower, oh, no. Mm. Yep, 10 children, gone. Absolutely gone. Ready to have a new wife. So Louisa's had three husbands in 10 months. Okay, good going. Two of which much, much older than her. Her at 46, as I said. And while it may sound like marriage was now her full-time job, hunting husbands, she had been employed over the years as a housekeeper. Many times. Many, many, many times. Many, 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 times. many, many times. Oh, 20 jobs oh, she oh. had between 1950 and 1953. That's impressive, in three mm, years. Yeah. Yeah. Now, it's it's thought it was definitely that number at that time. So maybe the previous husband, she had been a housewife, she had done some bits and pieces of work. But she was let go from all of these, unsurprisingly, having had 20 jobs. I don't think she was moving around that much. Either slipping her hand into the, yeah. to the silverware into the housekeeping money, or just generally being awful just at being her job. dreadful at your job. <laughs> mm. Louisa was not a hardworking soul. No. Nor particularly amiable to her employers. <laughs> she wasn't actively disruptive or actively violent or aggressive. No, she just preferred to be down the pub. Well, who doesn't really? Down the pub, knocking back the ale. I'm, yeah, I'm with her. And, and we can all relate. Absolutely. Oh, God, yeah, absolutely. Are you feeling that this week? Like, you would just want to be in the pub, <laughs> with an, probably in. with a nice glass of wine in your yeah, case. Probably not an ale. But uh, yeah, <laughs> and, uh, oh, a nice sofa and a glass of wine. I'd be quite happy. And a book. And a book. And a couple yeah. of drinks in, you start railing against <laughs> your employers and people around her. Because Louisa did. Louisa yeah. liked to loosen her tongue. Yeah, I can see that happening. There seems to be kind of a sneering contempt for her employers. You know, no niceties that she was sharing <laughs> with anyone, not at all. She didn't care a jot about hard work and she would take whatever she could get hold of. No violent tendencies or hardened criminal activities, but just an unlikable woman. Alfred had the appearance of being rather quiet, rather blank. He was going deaf, Mm -hmm. actually. So he didn't make much of an impression. Mm, But we'll see. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) No, no, no. This this maintains through through the through the story. Just, Um. just, but still bear it in mind. (laughs) I'm not leading to anything. No, not at all. No. No, not at all. (laughs) But in March 1953. Both Louisa and Alfred were fortunate enough to find employment as a housekeeper and handyman at the home of an elderly old woman, 79-year-old Sarah Ann Ricketts. Okay. She had a very nice little bungalow in Blackpool. Lovely. So they'd moved up to Blackpool by now. There are photos of it that you can see, and it's a very cute Victorian bungalow, bay windows, really pretty. Very nice. Really, really nice. And, you know, right, they've landed on their feet. Mm. Excellent. Now, you can probably imagine these two coming in, these kind of slightly, well, Louisa certainly a bit of a drinker, not the best housekeeper in the world, thinking this is fantastic, and a poor, innocent old woman who's in the bungalow they're going to take advantage and of. She doesn't have to do stairs. No, she doesn't have to do stairs. No stairs. Bloody marvellous. I want a bungalow. <laughs> Is it the walking up and down or the cleaning of them? Oh, I mean, so he, you leave stuff upstairs, and you've got to go upstairs, and you come downstairs, <laughs> then you forgot the other thing that's upstairs, and you've got to go back upstairs again. <laughs> so much, if there's just no stairs, it'd be so much easier. Everything would be easier without stairs. Absolutely. <laughs> right. Just a one continuously flat plane. Right. But a huge bungalow. But a huge bungalow. That stretches across the city. <laughs> I think you'd be annoyed at that too. Because you're like, oh, I've got to go to bungalow. It doesn't have to be that big. <laughs> well, I don't know. It does. <laughs> you have high standards and many, yes, many, yeah, this is true. many, many fancy things. <laughs> Dear old lady in the bungalow, you can imagine. I can't. Well, stop that right now. I am her. Stop that because Sarah Ricketts is as bitter and twisted as the day is long, Nick. I am still her. No. (laughs) (laughs) She is your spirit animal. (laughs) No, she, well, she's actually a tiny, tiny woman of but four foot eight. Brilliant. And she is not a a simple, innocent, lovely lady in her bungalow. Excellent. No, she's a fierce temper on her. Brilliant. A fierce temper. And she wastes no time in complaining. Ah. 
about everybody. Excellent. Loves to complain, loves to point out the faults that her servants have made, her staff, constantly nitpicking everything that they did. Sarah also was a serial will maker. <laughs> she is okay. a widow. She has she has children, but she absolutely loved, loved nothing more than making out her will to different beneficiaries and then tearing it up. <laughs> right in front of her face. Yep, exactly. If you've done a single thing to displease me, out of the will you are. Mm. Mm-hmm. She had lost two husbands. Both of them had killed themselves. <laughs> I mean, she sounds a delight. <laughs> Both of them had gassed themselves in the kitchen. Oh, God. Just that is that is a bad dinner. It, yeah. <laughs> it's just, okay, I can't take with this anymore. <laughs> God, this so you know, just, I'm not saying that she was the cause, but she was definitely the she cause. She definitely was the cause, yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Those, yeah, yeah. Loves changing her will. Whether all of this stuff is a way of getting attention, she's obviously... <laughs> suffered some tragedy in her life is she trying to get attention Mostly is she self trying inflicted to... by well just it. be a nicer person <laughs> maybe just be a bit nicer you've now got these two rather toxic personalities clashing in the house sarah a miserable miserly old woman who flew into rages but now she had reason to be furious because louisa was far more interested in getting absolutely wasted at the local pub than actually taking care of her employer which mm. she was being paid to do she was supposed to make sure she was fed and look after her clean the house tend to her tend to her every need and sarah ricketts immediately begins complaining that the pair she says to friends that the merrifields are not giving her enough food they're not feeding her oh and they're helping themselves to the larder they're helping themselves to the housekeeping money and they are buying alcohol and going carousing and keeping untoward company <laughs> mm no I don't know why she didn't fire them. Yeah, I mean, she, she, yes, it doesn't seem to have a problem getting rid of other people. And, <laughs> well, that's the thing. Maybe it's slightly sad is that as a crotchety, nasty old woman as she is, she's probably very lonely. Probably quite lonely. And wants to keep staff on so she has someone to yell at. Yeah. Yeah. Louisa yeah, doesn't care what doesn't, she says because she shit. is down the pub complaining about Mrs. Ricketts. Oh, very loudly to everyone. And drinking to the point where she can barely stand. Nice. She is not... A subtle woman. <laughs> she is not having a couple of dubonets and then going off. No, she is downing the pints and, and like staggering around the place, going on Brilliant. and on and on about the old woman in the house. And then she starts telling people in the pub that she has a great big inheritance coming her way. Mm. Mm. She would talk about her employer, who was dead. Oh. And that they had left her everything. <gasps> Sarah's very much still alive. Yeah. Bit cold and hungry in the house with the lights <laughs> a bit, off. A bit grumpy. Yeah. <laughs> no, Louisa starts saying that she's got, she's been working with someone and they've died and they're leaving them everything. That she is going to leave her, that Sarah Ricketts has left her or is going to leave her the bungalow. Mm-hmm. The bungalow that's worth £3,000 at Very the time. Nice. Now, Alfred, the husband, if you're wondering what he's up to, he's said to be increasingly deaf and confused. He, he can <laughs> okay. barely hear. He doesn't know what's going on. Uh, he's in his 70s now. Mm. He's not going to be able to support Louisa's drinking habits for long. And Louisa must be thinking, okay, well, if the old lady dies or fires us, what have we got left? Alfred's not going to support me. I can't rely on him. Hmm. Hmm. Something must be done to yes. make sure the cash keeps flowing so somehow by march 1953 louisa had tidied up her act enough just enough or whatever she had done to persuade sarah ricketts to change her will that's good going Mm. leave the bungalow to her Mm -hmm. now whether she was playing sweetness and light and they got on Mm. or whether she played up to the fact that sarah ricketts quite liked changing her will yeah well that's true yeah yeah, it's spreading like, gossip about the other people. Yeah. So she should change her will. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe she uses it as an act of punishment. She goes, I'm writing you into my will, so you better behave yourself, otherwise I'm going to change yeah, it. True, yeah, true, true. So she could do that. But Louisa was thorough in her actions. Not only has she gotten Sarah to sign the will, but in April, she gets Dr. Ewell. How fitting. Dr. Ewell. Dr. Ewell. To come to the house and certify that Sarah was mentally competent to make the new will. Okay, well, that's thorough. Yeah, so the doctor comes in like, what am I doing here? So like, he pay, <laughs> pays him two shillings yeah. and something going, is she mentally competent? Uh, yes, sign this. Thank you very much. Okay. Crossing all the T's and dotting all the I's and things. Indeed. Crossing all the dots too. Cross, crossing all the dots as yeah. well. Alfred apparently, who's stumbling around deaf and doesn't know what's going on, it has the foresight to kind of go, am I in the wheel? And she's like, oh, fine, I'll put you in there too. Dr. Yule would later state, Maryfield said the reason that she wanted me to go 
to the house was that the old lady might die at any minute. Any moment, any moment now. With stroke or a disease. <laughs> and she wanted to keep herself all right with the relatives. Okay. By signing everything. Yeah, by different. stealing all their inheritance. I'm not <laughs> Okay. Yeah. But the will is now certified. Louisa just has to play the waiting game. Mm. Yes, this old woman will pop a clog surely enough. Mm. Later that month, <laughs> Louisa called out another doctor, Dr. Wood, who also worked with Dr. Yule, claiming Sarah was seriously ill. Death store. Death store. Dr. Wood's energy I quite like. Because he arrives and goes, it, yeah, it's a tiny bit of bronchitis. <laughs> she's fine. So so Louisa is probably willing and going, yes, she's definitely dying now, isn't she? <laughs> she's got a mild cough. And the doctor would later say, I remonstrated with Mrs. Merrifield for calling me out, as I thought, under false pretenses. Mm. She again said she was afraid something would happen during the night. And Mrs. Merrifield mentioned something about a will. I said I wasn't interested. <laughs> <laughs> like it. Like it. She just, I don't care. No, I just don't care. Don't care. Yes, there's a will. <laughs> really don't care. <laughs> Whatever you're doing, none of Brilliant. my business. Well, the waiting game's boring. Let's play Hungry Hungry Hippos. <laughs> Old joke there. Perhaps it was time... Speed things up. Mm, help things along a bit, potentially. Maybe with scones. <laughs> She's just stuffed full of scones. <laughs> <laughs> Aut Autopsy just explodes with, stones, with scones. <laughs> There's too much jam. So, Louisa, off she goes to the local chemists to pick up a little rat poison. <laughs> That'll but do it. This rat poison does not contain... The A word. Mustn't say it. Mustn't say it. Mustn't the alarm will go off. It's contained jam. It's a jam-based rat poison. <laughs> jam-based, mm, yeah. mm, mm. Those rats, they love jam. They actually do. No, it was phosphorus-based. Ooh. And it has been a while, a very, very long while since the glowing spectre of mm. phosphorus has made an appearance on the show. But here it is. That it has. A phosphorus rat poison. Okay. So it gives them a nice glow. A nice, yes, nice glow in the dark rat so you can see them scurrying. <laughs> yeah. so see easier, them dying. Easier to catch <laughs> when they're glow in the dark. <laughs> So there you go, phosphorus-based rat poison. This is a general vermin exterminator. She takes this back home, and she plans on how she's going to slip it to the old lady. And she goes about putting it into her favourite treat, into the jars of sweet <laughs> jam that Sarah Ricketts would literally eat from with a spoon. Nice. That was her favourite treat. She Just sit there with a spoon and some jam. The jar of jam, spoon into the mouth. Get it in. Nice, nice, nice shows on the radio, oh, on yeah. the wireless. Oh yeah, there with your, <laughs> your bucket of jam. And she liked to chase it with either a stout or some rum. Excellent. Ah, oh, good choice. Hearty, hearty diet. Yeah, That's absolutely. Everything you need there. Jam and rum. Jam, jam, jam. So into the jam jars, the rat poison is stirred. Around the 12th of April, we know this is, when she starts administering it. We know it's this because Louisa goes out for the day and tells a friend of hers while she's out having a chat that, oh, I must go back to the house. I've got to lay the old woman out. <laughs> okay. <laughs> friend says, is, is she dead? Louisa says, she's not dead yet. She soon will be. <laughs> Just cackle and run away, rubbing your hands. Why not? Now, there was allegedly another doctor's visit while Sarah was getting sicker. Now, this is mentioned, and it may have been the visit by Dr. Wood, the rather cynical man beforehand. Mm -hmm. But just the crucial element that is mentioned in some of the records without the specific date is that one doctor would complain that they had come to see Sarah Ricketts, couldn't really get access to the bed because Alfred had pushed the dining room table up to the bed and was eating his lunch at it. Well, constant supervision of the ailing old lady. Yeah. Look, no, just he wasn't looking after her. He just pushed the table in there and sat down just with a sandwich. His lunch. I think it was it may have been a sandwich. It might have been a whole pheasant for all I know. But yeah, was just eating his lunch and the doctor was like, This is weird. He's sitting there, eyeballing her, eating her jam. Ah, <laughs> it's my jam now. He got confused because he's quite confused in death. He's eating mustard, go, This is horrible. But regardless of the doctor's visits and bedside dining, old Sarah Ricketts did indeed end up eating her lovely, lovely jam. Mm. And she died on the evening of the 14th of April, 1953. When she died, Louisa decided not to call out the doctor till the next no, morning. No, 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 no. Eh, why wake anyone up? Doctors arrive, along with the police are called. Obviously, it's a, it's, a, it's a sudden death. Louisa did have time to call out the Salvation Army band to play Abide With Me outside the house. <laughs> okay. I don't think the doctor had even checked the corpse yet. <laughs> but dedication. she's out there. Conducting them along. <laughs> yep, the old woman is gone. I'm Definitely not dead. dead. 
She's also merrily talking to the police, neighbours, journalists who turn up and go, oh, what's going on? Oh, she's having a chat with them as the police are just going in and going, okay, what's happened to this old lady? Now, <laughs> there's obviously suspicions have started to be aroused probably because of the general chat of Louisa and it will emerge that several people do come forward mm. but yes definitely people are sort of shuffling around the house and Louisa's talking to these journalists who have turned up and go, oh is there anything going on in the house and she's telling them the police have been coming and going for several days it is very upsetting especially after having tried to do our best for Mrs Ricketts as we did I shall be glad when the matter is all cleared up short yourself so when the doctor attends the scene and finally gets through the, the playing band <laughs> and the journalists Gets in to see her. Louise is immediately saying, quick creation. We just, we need to burn her. Yeah. Burn, burn her quickly. Her. Yep, absolutely. When they're like, no, that's <laughs> not how it's done. Louisa explains that quite openly. She doesn't want the family to know about her death. Okay. Doesn't want Mrs. Ricketts' daughter, she has two daughters, or the extended family, to have anything to do with the funeral. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Possibly raising some alarm bells there, I should hope. Yeah, Dr. <laughs> Wisely backs out of the room, doesn't sign the death certificate. Well, she's holding it in front of him and going, could you sign this, please? In the meantime, Sarah's Ricketts' death has been reported in the press. And Louise's friend, who had she had been chatting with earlier, she recalls this weird conversation she'd had with her friend about Mrs. Ricketts. Louisa talking about, oh, the old woman will be dead soon, <laughs> rightly goes to the police. Good for her. A post-mortem is carried out and they indeed find that Sarah has died from phosphorus poisoning mm. via the rat poison. They find no evidence of the poison in the bungalow, but they do find a record of the sale at the chemist in the Merrifield name. Mm -hmm. And so the Merrifields are arrested. And I think that's time for a drink. Oh, yes. So, both Louisa and Alfred have been arrested on suspicion of murder. Ooh. The trial is set for July 1953. Now, Alfred continues to appear confused and bewildered. <laughs> okay. This is remarked upon loads in the run-up to the trial. So, he's in his 70s now. Yeah. So, so yeah, he's going to be fairly confused and bewildered. Going deaf. Yeah. Yeah, just sort of wandering around like, uh, very quiet, doesn't really understand what's going on, is, mm. is confused by the proceedings. Oh, it said he him. does inappropriate behaviour in the courtroom, probably was him just going, what? What's what? going on? Why am I here? Conversely, Louisa, absolutely loving the attention. Yeah, that's not surprising. And not winning herself any favours. <laughs> oh, she turns up at the courtroom smiling, <laughs> waving at the crowds and at photographers. Hello, like, like Hello. she's the star. Like, Got her best hat. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, wonderful day out at court. Oh, she's not a glamorous gal, Louisa, mm. But she is completely sure she is going to walk away scot free. Absolutely, she's going with it. She's making the most of her five minutes of fame here. Completely confident. She boasts in court about her kindness to Mrs. Ricketts, about the work that she's done. She waves a hand, she waves at her husband while she's standing in the dock and pleads not guilty, of course. Unfortunately, there are plenty of witnesses mm. friends doctors people down the pub strangers <laughs> from the street who all confirmed that louisa had boasted to them whether they knew her or not about that she was getting a massive inheritance from an old woman and that her employer was going to die soon she's not been the most subtle about it has she really no, no. and yet her confidence belies this yeah. acting like no 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 absolutely not all they're fine. not gonna get me she wrote in one letter they read out a letter that she wrote to a friend saying, I got a nice job nursing an old lady and she left me a lovely little bungalow and thank God for it. So you see, love, all came right in the end. Mm. She wrote that two weeks before Sarah oh, Ricketts died. Oh dear. <laughs> Don't put things in writing. It's dangerous. Her friend, Jessie Brewer, the one who had had the various weird conversations, mm. said that she had spoken again with Louisa and said, we went, and Louisa had said, we went to live with an old lady and she died and she's left me a bungalow worth £4,000. It was all left to me until that old bugger, i.e. Alfred, got talking to her and then it was left to us jointly. <laughs> I made everything all right. It cost me two pounds and two shillings to get a doctor in to prove that she was in her right mind. Louisa had also been talking to a stranger at a bus stop. Again, <laughs> waiting for a bus. Stranger wants nothing to do with this. <laughs> I'm going to kill someone. Very loudly <laughs> saying she was very worried about the old lady she was looking after. Oh no, she's so <laughs> sick. It's like, who are I am traveling through this area? <laughs> I don't even speak English. Who are you? <laughs> yes, Louisa was saying the woman she cared for was very ill and then had said to this woman on the street, that she had found her husband in bed with the old lady. Oh. So Louisa starts to imply that Alfred 
had been in bed with Sarah Ricketts. Yeah. And he'd been messing about with her. And Unlikely, she, probably. She said, if this goes on again, I'll poison the old bugger and him as well. Okay. Yes. He's trying to find out some, find some excuses there. Mm. Now, this is all new. And this is a tactic that Louisa shares in court. This implication mm. that Alfred was either having an affair with Sarah Ricketts or, far worse, was interfering with her. Mm. Which is pretty grim. Yeah. Or is she trying to lay someone out to blame? Absolutely. Yes, trying to de- deflect blame there, most certainly. He doesn't answer to any of these things. Again, yeah. he's too confused. It takes the jury just six hours to find Louisa Merrifield guilty of Sarah Ricketts' murder. They could not reach a verdict on Alfred. Yeah, he doesn't really seem to know what's going on, does he? He was acquitted. The judge described Louisa's actions as a wicked, as wicked and cruel a murder as I have ever heard tell of and called Louisa a vulgar and stupid woman with a very dirty mind. <laughs> okay. And he described Alfred as a tragic simpleton. Now, there were plenty of mutters that Alfred probably had more to do with this murder than had been laid out in court. Mm. He presented himself as simple and quiet, but surely Louisa couldn't have acted alone. Is this just another case of a judge going after the woman, of making out that she is the root of all evil and the man is just simple and has been led (laughs) astray? Claim that maybe he bought the poison, that there was some evidence that he had bought the poison, that he had prevented Mrs Ricketts from getting in new solicitors to change her will again. Either way, Alfred is let off, Mm. attempts to try him again, fail. All charges against him are dropped. Louisa tried to appeal her case, but the sentence remained. She would be executed by Albert Pierpoint on the 18th of September, 1953. And she was the third to last woman to be hanged in Britain. (laughs) She did reconcile with Alfred just before she was hanged, saw him in the cells and said, goodbye, Alfie, look after yourself and God bless. And Pierpoint said her hanging went very well. Very well. We did it very well. Yes. Very efficient. Very efficient. <laughs> in the final act, Alfie did indeed look after himself. He moved straight into the bungalow. Yes, yeah, so he's now got the bungalow for himself. Yep. <laughs> and apparently was sharp enough to fight a lengthy battle mm. with Mrs. Ricketts' daughters for several years okay. over his claim to the bungalow. So Not that stupid. Confused, deaf, doesn't know what's going on. Stuck to that bungalow, <laughs> yeah. dug his heels in, walked mm. away with a portion of the ownership of the property. Okay. I think one, some places said that he got quite a bit. One was that it was a sixth of the value. It's still mm. enough. He would then move into a caravan in Blackpool and he became a bit of a local sightseeing attraction. Oh, God. He would go to the sideshows on the beach of Blackpool as the murderer's husband. show himself off tell the stories about what it was like he sold clothes to the Blackpool Madame Two Swords Museum and was paid 200 pounds because they put a waxwork of him and Louisa Mm. in the Chamber of Horrors not that stupid he died in 1962 aged 80 (laughs) so that is the story of Louisa and Alfred Merrifield see I was prepared to write Alfred off there Mm. but no so that that end bit he, he suddenly Switched himself on a bit, didn't he? Yeah. Fighting court battles, selling his story, <laughs> selling his clothes. Telling so everything. Selling everything. Selling and his body. Yeah. Telling yeah. stories for a few coins and things. Oh, so, yeah. He's certainly mm. not, not quite as simple as a thing people make out, perhaps. It's a case that's been covered and, and revisited over the years. And there's been a couple of in-depth epi- um, essays on it and writings where people have thought, was Louisa... As, as horrible a person as she was, mm. you know, she definitely was fine with killing Sarah Ricketts. Yeah. There's no question of that whatsoever and talked about it at length. Did she act completely alone? Mm. Why was all the attention on her? Was it another case of, oh, the woman's got to be responsible? Yeah. She wasn't a particularly attractive woman. And so people again were like, oh, she's vulgar. She's lower class. Oh, yeah, she's not pretty. Yeah, let's just let's blame her for everything. I mean, we've seen plenty of cases of femme fatales where they're like, oh, the seductress, she's got to be <laughs> Yeah, you can't win. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You can't win. Going to get but, you one way or the other. Yeah, Alfred could definitely play the confused, yeah, deaf old man. And no one really pursued it. No. But indeed. it was Louisa who'd been shouting about it down the pub and getting absolutely wasted. Well, that's the thing, yeah. I mean, he was just very, very quiet and unass- mm. unassuming and sort of under the radar. She, yeah, she's the one who's been down the pub screaming and shouting about it. Mm. And she's not exactly been subtle 
No. Um, if she had been somewhat more circumspect about the whole thing, then <laughs> she may well have yeah. got away with it as well. Well, that's the thing. It's that was Alfred down the pub with her. Mm. There's no records of what he was doing at this yeah. time. It's he can't have been protesting against it. He was in no. there getting quids in. And then the judge ended up calling Louisa this vulgar, dirty-minded woman, which is not fair, as in he's being very judgmental there because of this allegation that she's thrown out yeah. that, oh, Alfred was fiddling with Sarah Ricketts. Mm. What if that was true? Yeah, well, it's a horrible, a horrible thought if it mm. was. But, um... And she was happy to turn a blind eye to it. I mean, it's a dark twist that, to That it. really is, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry, but um, it's, yeah, but then just sort of going, oh, it's a vulgar-minded woman. Like, what if he was doing something? Well, he was, but... Because what was it? Was he, he wasn't in the pub. He was back at the house, just sitting, you know, sitting old, not feeding the old woman anyway. <laughs> she was complaining that she was starving. Mm. Yes. Well, well, that's a disturbing one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Sometimes we have to bring these things up. We do, Nick. Well, what do you think, people? What do you think of the story of Louisa Merrifield? And what do you think of Alfred's part in this story? I mean, Louisa and Sarah Ricketts, they're, they're, they're both pretty cantankerous Oh, yeah, women. Not the nicest of people, whatever happened. No. Uh, <laughs> and stupid as well. Yeah, not not the master criminal, really. No, absolutely not. Walking around, kind of going, she's definitely going to die. She's going to die soon. Oh, look, she's left me this house two weeks before she dies. Yeah. Mm. It's a thinker, but what do you think? Jump on the comments of the social media channels that you follow or wherever you listen to this podcast and share your thoughts, your theories. Send us suggestions of what might have happened. But you know what? I think you should mix up a bramble margarita. A bramble margarita. To I think go you're with right. your story. A, a, more lime. More lime. More lime to yeah to or less jam. <laughs> How much jam did you put in? Put in like two teaspoons of jam. Oh, less than that, mate. For, I don't well, know. We was two drinks. Two drinks. I made two, so it's like mm-hmm. a teaspoon per per drink. But it is. I think it is a particularly. It's more of a jelly than a jam. That one. So uh, I think it is. Particularly sweet. Must be jelly because jam don't shake. <laughs> I thought it was nice. Okay, I really yeah, enjoyed right. it. I wouldn't have another. It's too too sweet for me. Yeah. I think more lime in there to balance that out and it would have been mm. very nice. Make a few. Yeah. Drink them all. Different ratios of lime. See how you feel about it. That's the way forward. Yeah. Experimentation. Got to get these things right. See what you think. It's a Nick special. It's a Nick original. So mix one up and put your own twists on it, if you will, and tell us what you think. But make sure you're tagging us in any pictures of cocktails that you are enjoying over the weekend because we'd love to know what you're drinking and what you're doing and what you're thinking while you're drinking and doing things. (laughs) Yes. Mm. And don't forget to keep sending us more stories that we can cover for the Christmas period up into December and into New Year. And if you haven't already, please consider joining us on Patreon for lots of extra episodes, bonus material and lots of fun and frolics. Thanks for listening, guys. We have been the people inside the Poisoner's Cabinet. We will see you next week. And remember... Your loved ones are trying to kill you. Bye.